Now, the subject that I'm going to preach on tonight is, is a subject that's misunderstood by so many people, and I'd like to clear it up for you tonight, and I hope that this will help you to understand it. I'm going to be very thorough in the subject tonight. I'm going to preach to you on the subject of the correlation between the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's so much confusion about it, and so many people have different ideas about it, and most of them are wrong, unfortunately. And although the Bible is very clear on this subject, many people don't understand it. Maybe even some people that are sitting here right now don't have it clear in their mind, don't understand some of the issues that we're going to talk about tonight. And so I'm going to go very thoroughly through the Bible and show this to you, beginning in Hebrews chapter number 9. Now look at verse number 8. And first I want to say this. If you want to understand the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, what's the difference? Because people seem to go to, to one extreme or the other that are unscriptural extremes, I'm saying. And if you really want to understand the correlation, the book of Hebrews is where it's the most thoroughly explained. That's part of the purpose of the book of Hebrews, is to uh, tie in the whole Bible and to show you an overview of the entire Bible. The book of Hebrews is great for that. But there are people, for example, and let me give you the two extremes before I teach you the truth from the Bible. There are people who would say that everything in the Old Testament we should be practicing today. Now, you could take that to so many extremes. Are we going to have an animal sacrifice? No. Or uh, the Seventh-day Adventists say that we need to observe the Sabbath today in the New Testament. Uh, there are Seventh-day Adventists also who teach that you cannot eat pork because of the Mosaic Law. There are people who uh, teach all these various things. Then there's the other extreme of the Neo-Evangelicals who just want to throw out the entire Old Testament laws and don't want to obey any of them. And then there are the uh, dispensationalists who throw out a lot of the commandments of the Old Testament. Uh, then there are even more uh, damaging heresies, like people who teach that people were saved by works in the Old Testament, or uh, strange doctrines like that. I'm going to help you to understand tonight the correlation between the Old Testament and the New Testament as it stands in Scripture. Let's begin in Hebrews chapter 9, and we're going to see the first difference between Old Testament and New Testament. Look at verse number 8. And it's explained clearly in detail. The Bible says, The Holy Ghost this signified, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Watch these next words. Which was a figure for the time then present. Do you see that? God is saying that the tabernacle was a figure for the time then present. Is he saying here that the tabernacle applied to him at that time? No. He's saying back then... The tabernacle was a place where di uh, divine service was administered, is the word used in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 1. And he explains here that it was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that's talking about the animal sacrifices, that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in, watch these words mentioned, meats, and drinks, and divers washings, and carnal ordinances imposed on them forever. Is that what it says? No. It says imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So, when was the period that the Jews went to the tabernacle, offered animal sacrifices, had laws governing meats, drinks, and carnal ordinances, or fleshly ordinances, he says that that time was until the time of Reformation. You say, when was that? Well, look at the next verse. The Bible always defines itself. But Christ being come, talk about the first coming of Jesus Christ, but Christ being come, a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, we see that Christ's coming was the time of Reformation, is what the Bible calls it. You say, oh, I thought the Reformation was Martin Luther and John Huss and everything. Well, people apply labels to things, but when the Bible talks about the time of Reformation, it's talking about Jesus Christ's coming, as defined here in Hebrews chapter 9. And so, right here, God is telling us right away that some of the things in the Old Testament, some of the things in the Old Testament were temporary. Like, for example, the tabernacle. Now, if you think about it, there was a time before the tabernacle was built, wasn't there? When there was no tabernacle. God established the tabernacle with the Mosaic Law in the book of Exodus. 
That's when the tabernacle was built. That's when the specific laws about washings, meats, drinks, uh, the animal sacrifices in detail were made in the book of Exodus. That's where it started. Uh, that's the Mosaic law. Was it permanent or temporary? Now, we're not talking about the whole law, the whole Mosaic law. We're only talking about what God has specifically mentioned. The tabernacle, the animal sacrifices, the washings, the foods, and the drinks. That's all we're talking about. Was it permanent or temporary? It's temporary. It was until the time of Reformation. Now, if you would, look back to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter number 9. And I'm going to show you something interesting about this. Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter number 9, we'll see something long before the Mosaic Law. This is Noah getting off the ark. So this is way long time before Moses gave the law, which God gave through Moses. The Bible says the law was given by Moses in John chapter 1. But look at Genesis chapter 9, and we'll begin reading in verse number 3. The Bible reads, Every moving thing, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Now, does that say not to eat pork? No. Does that say not to eat any kind of meat? No. It says... Any moving, living, breathing animal is acceptable for human consumption. That's Genesis chapter 9. Okay, this is a lot, look down in the chapter, look at verse 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Now that's a permanent commandment, because that's stated as being something that would last forever in Leviticus. It says it will be forever, not to eat any blood in any generation. And in Acts chapter 15, even, that's reiterated, not to eat blood. That is a satanic practice. And so God is not talking about here a dietary choice. Oh, blood's not healthy for you. No, he's saying don't eat blood because if you eat blood, you're satanic. And I, pre I, I preached this a few weeks ago, how witchcraft and eating blood tie hand in hand. And I showed that uh, in the Bible about two weeks ago. But flip back, if you, actually stay in Genesis 9. Look at verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. That's the death penalty. For in the image of God made he man. Look at the next verse. And you be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. These are commandments that God gave to the human race, to Noah, to every human being at that time. Noah and his children and their wives. And he says to them, don't eat, he said, eat whatever meat you want, but don't eat blood. Institute the death penalty. If somebody kills somebody, it's your job, human being, to execute and kill that person. That's the death penalty. He says, it's your job to uh, be married and have children and be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and have many children. These are laws that God gave to mankind in Genesis 9. Now flip back to Hebrews 9. Now we know that after Genesis 9, hundreds and hundreds of years later, with the Mosaic law... Moses giving the law uh, in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Do you remember how God said that they could only eat certain meats? That's when the tabernacle was instituted. Do you remember those laws when you're reading through the book of Leviticus? And it talks about leprosy. And it talks about if you get a scab. And it has a hair in it. Do you remember that? Isn't that your favorite part of the Bible? Doesn't, don't just the tears just well up in your eyes. And you just, you just love to read the Bible when, when you're reading about the, the white spot and the rising... And if the hair is a little bit yellowish in color, you remember all that? And you got to wash it. And then if you have leprosy and you have this disease spreading in your body, you've got to be quarantined and wash your body. And then uh, once you're all clean and everybody pronounces you clean, then you shave your head and shave your eyebrows, right? And shave your whole body. Remember that? Uh, these are the washings, the, the, the carnal ordinances. You say, what does the word carnal mean? Carnal doesn't necessarily mean that it's sinful or wrong. Who, who speaks Spanish in here? A couple people? Okay, you know what the word carne means, right? And uh, the word carne means meat, okay? But in the Bible, you know what the Bible uses for the word meat? Flesh. Giving, it talks about them having flesh to eat. When the Bible uses the word meat, it's just talking about food. Like, for example, the meat offering was fine flour mingled with oil. That's obviously not meat as we would think of it. That's bread. But God calls it meat. And he calls meat flesh. Okay? And so carnal means fleshly ordinances. We're not talking about morality like right and wrong. 
We're talking about like cleanliness. We're talking about dietary choice, foods, drinks, washings, carnal ordinances. We don't go and show ourselves to the priest if, if our hair doesn't look right or whatever, if we have a scab on our arm and a white spot on our eyes. Yeah, I don't know, you might want to get that checked out, but uh, it's not a law that we're following because those were a figure, a picture of something for the time then present. You see, God's laws are eternal. But he imposed extra carnal ordinances <laughs> on the Jews from the time of Moses to the time of Christ. Okay, isn't that, I mean, that's what it says. I'm not making this up or getting this from some theology book. That's what it says in Hebrews chapter 9. That God created some symbolic laws. And that was the purpose of them. Symbolism. Figurative. He created these symbolic laws with, the, with Moses the First Testament, the Old Testament, and he gave it to him just until the time of Christ. Now you say, wait a minute, isn't the Old Testament the whole 39 books? Well, when the Bible used the word Old Testament, it's not just referring to the 39 books. Okay, it, The word Old Testament is talking about the Old Covenant. And you say, well, prove that. Well, because the Bible says in verse number 20, or you back, get back to Hebrews chapter 9 if, if you're not already there, but it says in verse 18, Whereupon neither the First Testament was dedicated without blood. So what are we talking about when we talk about the First Testament? For when Moses, do you see that? That's the First Testament. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the Testament which God hath enjoined unto you. So we see here that there was the First Testament which was with Moses. And then there was the New Testament, which was Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 1, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now let me ask you something. Is Genesis chapter 9 part of the Mosaic law? No, that was something that was commanded by God to Noah. Okay, That's not the first testament. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when God is removing some things that were only until the time of Christ... Number one, he's only removing things that are part of the First Testament, which is the Mosaic Law. Number two, he's only removing certain specific things that he mentions. You can't just take the Mosaic Law and throw it out and say, well, this doesn't apply to me. Then why do we even have, why is it even in the Bible? Of course it applies to you. The Bible says that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, he said, Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass. Till heaven and earth pass. Did he say till Christ? No. He said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. And this is what he said. Listen to this. In verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. He's talking about the Mosaic law. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That means if Pastor Anderson got up right now and told you that the, some of the laws in the Mosaic law, and I'm not talking about the specific carnal fleshly ordinances that he says were done away with the time of Christ. If I told you, well, this law doesn't really apply to us, go ahead and... Go ahead and get a divorce. You know, I know that the Bible says no, and, and I know that, 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 but that's the law. That's Old Testament. Or if I said to you, well, go ahead, men, wear women's clothing. Because Deuteronomy 22.5 is, is another dispensation. Good night. Don't be a cross-dressing, stinking queer in any dispensation. And I don't even believe in dispensations. It's a bunch of hogwash. But I'm going to tell you something. Of course the laws of God apply to you. Ladies, Deuteronomy 22.5 applies to you. Don't wear men's clothing. That is a moral law. That is, that is a law that has nothing to do with, with uh, washing or food or drink. Okay, That's a law that has to do with right and wrong. A principle that's throughout the Bible. God created male and female. In the New Testament, he has a whole chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 saying men need to have short hair, women need to have long hair. Why in the world would you think that the God who says that a man needs to have short hair and a woman needs to have long hair would all of a sudden decide 
non-gender specific clothing, unisex clothing is fine in the New Testament because Christ has come and died on the cross. What kind of sense does that make? It makes no sense, is the answer. And so don't throw out, Jesus said, watch it, don't throw out my Old Testament laws. He said, you'll be the least in the kingdom of heaven. You're going to be called Mr. Zero up there when you get to heaven if you throw out and teach other people not to obey the commandments of God. But we must understand that God is specifically saying in Hebrews chapter 9 that these carnal ordinances about washings, foods, drinks have been repealed. He's very specific about it. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4. Right before, you're, you're in Hebrews, just go back just a few pages, and you'll be in 1 Timothy chapter number 4. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 reads in verse number 3, Forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving, of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Doesn't that sound familiar to Genesis chapter 9? You see how consistent the Bible is? In Genesis 9, God says, eat whatever kind of meat you want. In the Mosaic law, there was a figure for the time then present, washings, meat, drink, carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation, but Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not his building. Now we're in the New Testament in 1 Timothy 4, and he's saying, every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it's sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now I can show you other places in the New Testament that illustrate that truth, but there's an example of a place where God tells you, eat whatever meat you want. And then he says right after that, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, saying it's something that you need to be teaching. That we are not under these restrictions. Good night. Tell the world that they can eat pork. You know? I love pork. I had a lot of pork today. We went down to this, uh, man, I love these Mongolian barbecues. Man, I love it. And uh, you build your own, and they cook it up for you. I'm going to tell you something. The meat that I focused on when I was building my own was pork. Because pork is my favorite meat. I go to, and that's why I believe it. No, Actually, the Bible says it, and that's why I believe it. But whenever I go to Chipotle, carnitas. Okay, that's the best burrito that they offer. Okay, with the, they have the organic, uh, grain-fed, free-range pork. That's good, okay? And so, and I just sanctify it with prayer, and it's great. But anyway, the point is, God is not going to throw out Old Testament laws Dead sure if they're not in the Mosaic Law, number one. But number two, the ones in the Mosaic Law, it's only specific things that he's doing away with. So far, we've seen the carnal ordinances. Now, look at Romans chapter number six. Romans chapter number six, and keep your finger in, in Hebrews seven, if you, if you have that many fingers to stick in there. <laughs> Romans chapter number six says in verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Watch this. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. You say, oh, we're not under the law. We're free in Christ. We're under grace. So we can do, we don't have to obey the laws of God. Wrong. And God's going to deal with that in the next verse. What laws, is, what laws are there that you don't want to obey? Well, there's the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. So we're under grace. Let's go steal. Let's go rob a store. Uh, we're under grace. Let's kill. We're under grace. I think I'll commit adultery. We're under grace. Let's curse God's name. Which law are you trying to break? Oh, well, those other laws, like about the clothing. Why are you trying to dress like the other gender? What's wrong with you? <laughs> Snap out of it. Dress like a woman. Dress like a man, respectively. Uh, you, you say, well, there's just a lot of laws in there. Okay, name one. Name the one that you don't want to obey. Name, name what you want to do that's contrary to the laws of God in the Old Testament. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And whatever it is that you're trying to do that's against God's laws is wrong, and you know it's wrong, because God said it's wrong. Oh, what about all those meats and clothes? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about God's laws of right and wrong. That's what we're talking about. 
and the law of the Lord stands forever. Now, if the Bible says every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever, and so that's the truth. But look at the next verse. He says, we're not under the law, but under grace. Now, don't stop reading there. It says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? He's saying, so if we're, if we're under grace, I guess we can disobey some of God's laws, right? No! He says, shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid! The New Testament defines sin in 1 John as the transgression of the law. It's 1 John chapter 3, verse, who, verse 4. Whosoever committed sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And so he's saying, don't transgress the law just because you're under grace. Do we then make void the law through faith? Romans chapter 3. God forbid, he said, we establish the law. The laws of God are to be obeyed. And they're not to be sloughed off by some theologian somewhere. And again, we're not referring to the ones that he specifically repealed. But number two, there's another change in the law. Number one change, and I hope you're following the sermon tonight. Number one change, the fleshly ordinances. Food, drinks, uh, we're talking about uh, divers' washings, carnal ordinances. What else has changed? Look at Hebrews 7 and we'll see what else has changed. You say, what? There's been a change? I remember I was out soul winning and I talked to a Seventh-day Adventist and I, I try not to argue with them about any of their doctrine because really what they need is to get saved and then they'll understand it. So I just focus on the gospel and faith alone and eternal security and, and that's the real issue. I don't mess with them on all these other issues, but they will just try to get you off on Saturday. I said, look, there's more to the Bible than just a day of the week. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about salvation. Then we'll talk about that. And they said, they kept going on and on about this day of the week thing. And I said, well, you know what? The Bible says that the law has been changed. The Bible doesn't say that. They, I mean, the guy was mad. He said, there's nowhere in the Bible. You can't show me the Bible where it says the law has been changed. Well, look down at verse number 12 of Hebrews chapter 7. And I, this is what I showed him. I said, sure it does. I said, let me show you right here. Hebrews 7, 12, it says, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. You see that? And so, what's the second change? We saw the first change, the, the fleshly ordinances. Number two, there's been a change in priesthood. A change in priesthood. It says in verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law. Again, another proof that when the Bible's talking about the law, it's talking about the Mosaic law. Given by Moses, John 1. Right here, it says the law was given under the Levitical priesthood. Okay? And it says, and that was instituted with Moses. What further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there was made a necessity to change also the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. He's talking about Jesus. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, for he testified, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Watch the next words carefully. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. Do you see those words? And what is it saying? That we throw out the whole law? No. He's saying that the priesthood is gone. So, what laws of the Old Testament? We're trying to understand the relationship between Old Testament and New Testament. Okay. What part of the Old Testament are we commanded to obey? Well, number one, the only thing that we're throwing out so far is the carnal ordinances. The food, the drinks, the washings. But number two, anything that has to do with the Levitical priesthood does not apply because we have a new priesthood. So do we go down to a Levitical priest to sacrifice animals? No. Do we go down to the Levitical priest and have him look at our scab? No. Do we go down uh, to, the, to the priest and do anything? Should there even be a Levitical priest? No, it's gone. There's a new priesthood, the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ himself is the high priest, and every born-again, blood-washed believer is a priest. 
according to 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 2, and Revelation chapter 1. I'm not going to go into that. And so, we believe in the priesthood of the believer here as Baptists, and more importantly, as Bible-believing Christians. And so, you're a priest if you're saved, and Jesus Christ is the high priest. But there's been a change. The Levitical priesthood was one thing. The Melchizedekan priesthood is us as believers with Jesus as our high priest. Look at, uh, let's see, verse number 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. And as much as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, that by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily, as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. You say, why are you reading so much Bible? You're going down way too deep here. Go up! Don't come to church and expect to be spoon-fed some kind of a spiritual applesauce. You need to learn the Bible and know what the truth is. Maybe if you read the Bible, you'd care about this because you'd want to know how to understand Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You're going to spend a lot of time reading them. You better know what you're understanding. You better know where you're at. You better know the book of Hebrews and understand the correlation between the two. And so this is an important sermon. Number three, change. So we saw the change in the fleshly ordinances. Number two, we saw a change in priesthood. Number three, there's been a change in the Passover. Look at Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter number 12. A change in the Passover. This, this is important. Look at this. Exodus 12, 14. The Bible says in Exodus 12, 14, And this day, referring to the Passover, for sake of time, shall be unto you for a memorial. Watch this. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. So, will the Passover ever be done away with? No. The Passover will never be done away with, but there's been a change in the Passover. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, and I'll show you what that is. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. The Passover will never be. You say, not Pastor Anderson, you celebrate the Passover? Yes, I do. Amen. It says that it'll be a feast forever, but there's been a change in the Passover. Look, if you would, at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'll show you what that means. 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 7 reads, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. Watch this. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We don't need to go through the process of the Passover in Exodus 12, where we take a lamb and watch it for four days, and then we uh, kill the lamb and spread the blood on the doorpost, because our Passover is already sacrificed for us. But watch the next words. Therefore, let us talking about New Testament believers. Let us keep the feast. Has the feast been done away with? No. He says, purge out therefore the old leaven, but he says in verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You say, we keep the Passover? Yes, we do. It's called communion. It's called the Lord's Supper. We keep the Passover. We uh, drink the juice and we eat unleavened bread but we don't sacrifice any kind of meat because Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Do you see that, how the Passover continues on through communion in the local church? And so it's, it's very clear in the Bible, isn't it? If we, if we study and, and learn these things, it, 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 it all comes together for us. We understand. And here's a note about communion, by the way. I think it's wrong, and I'm just kidding. I, in fact, I know it's wrong. The way that these churches have communion with the little wafers like the Catholic Church. I'm talking about these little square little crackers, these little wafers that they pop in their mouth. But you say, why is that wrong, Pastor Anderson? Because it's supposed to represent the broken body of Jesus Christ. And Jesus break bread 
and gave the disciples, okay, at the Last Supper. He instituted, he said, this do in remembrance of me, and he broke unleavened bread. When we have communion here at Faith Forward Baptist Church, we take a piece of unleavened bread and we break it into pieces and administer it, and uh, the cup as well. Uh, but I'm going to tell you something. I, I don't think it's right to sit there and have some perfect little square cracker represent the broken body of Jesus. It's not supposed to be broken by you chewing it up, okay? It's supposed to be a broken piece of bread because it says, this is my body which is broken for you. And he broke bread and he gave it to the disciples. And so that's what we do. We get these big pieces of unleavened bread and we break them into small pieces. Yes, but they're broken pieces. They're not whole pieces. And that's the only point that I wanted to make with that. And in John 136, for example, just to, you don't have to turn there, but just to illustrate the change of Passover and looking up at G upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb of God. Okay? So there's been a change in what the sacrifice is. The sacrifice is Jesus. He's already been once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And so there's another change. Number four, there's a fourth change. The fourth change is found in... Uh, we'll turn to Colossians 2 and we'll see the fourth change. Number one, the, the fleshly carnal ordinances. Number two, we saw a change... In uh, the Passover, I'm sorry, a change in the law, a change in the priesthood. Number three, we saw a change in the Passover. And number four, we're going to see a change in the Sabbath day. As in, it's been done away with. You say, oh, the Sabbath's been changed to Sunday. Wrong. The Sabbath is gone. There is no uh, Sabbath day that we observe. There are people that are called Sunday Sabbatarians. You really needed to know that term, but it's people who think that on Sunday you can't do any work at all and you have to, like, obey the Sabbath. And there are also people who even have church on Saturday. Seventh-day Adventists, and there are, believe it or not, Seventh-day Baptists. Okay, Now, they're ignorant, my friend, and I'm going to show you how they're ignorant. Look at uh, Colossians chapter 2. We're, we're just going to look at three places. Well, we're not going to spend the whole night on this, but look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Tell me if this sounds familiar with everything else that we've been studying. I think you'll see how it ties in exactly. Look at Colossians 2, 16. Let no man therefore judge you in meat... Or in drink. Does that sound familiar? Meat or in drink. Or in respect of an holy day. Or of the new moon. Or of the Sabbath days. Okay? That's the, the, cardinal, the cardinal ordinances of meat, drink, and so forth. But he's now included in the list the Sabbath day as one of those carnal ordinances. Watch what he says. Which are a shadow of things to come. Doesn't that sound like the figure for the time then present? Uh... You say, well, I don't think a shadow is the same as a figure. Well, look, let me get a flashlight, and I'll shine a flashlight on myself. You'll see my figure reflected on the wall. You say, I'm still not convinced. Okay, Hebrews 10.1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, same word, right after Hebrews 9, where we started our sermon and showed about the carnal ordinances and the figure for the time then present, the next chapter, Hebrews 10.1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? So he says, the figurative sacrifices are a shadow of things to come, a shadow, a figure for the time then present. Here he says the same thing. Meat, drink, same thing. Holy days, same thing. Sabbath day, same thing. Done away with. Look at, uh, look if you would at verse number, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 14. Romans chapter 14. Go back in, uh, in the New Testament to Romans 14. Romans chapter number 14. You see, all these things in the Old Testament Mosaic law that were done away with are figurative things, symbolic things of Jesus Christ and New Testament truth. Now, you say, well, wait a minute. What about the death penalty? I've heard people say that they don't believe in the death penalty, that claim to be Christians... Their, their ignorance is astounding. Genesis chapter 9, the death penalty was instituted. Uh, the Mosaic Law, the death penalty is mentioned scores of times. The New Testament, Romans chapter 1, death penalty. Knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Okay? And, and on and on, we see, why would God take away the death penalty? Do you know why God instituted the death penalty? And I preached the whole sermon, man. If you haven't heard the sermon, get the tape on it. January uh, 7th or 14th, somewhere around there of this, of this year. In January, I preached a sermon on the death penalty. The whole sermon. And boy, we went up one side and down the other of the Bible on that. You've got to get that sermon if you, if you don't understand that issue. But I, I'm telling you, 
Why in the world would God repeal the death penalty in light of why he instituted the death penalty? You know why he instituted the death penalty? Because Cain slew Abel. Then Cain's descendant Lamech slew a young man and killed a young man. Nothing was done. Neither of them were executed. And just a few generations later, the whole world was overspread with violence. Violence was everywhere. Killing was on a rampage when Noah built the ark and when he and his family entered into the ark. And as soon as he gets off the ark, God says, we're not going to let that happen again. Death penalty. But now the world is such a happy, loving, sweet place, especially in Phoenix. Uh, we don't need the death penalty anymore. Oh, boy, do we need it more than ever. You know, all the jails are overcrowded. Then they need to kill some of these suckers. They need to kill these bunch of rapists. The Bible says death penalty to the rapists. They need to take these rapists out and kill them. They need to take these murderers out and kill them. If they would kill half the people in prison are worthy of death, according to the Bible, take them out and kill them all, and then they'd have room in their prisons. But instead, you know what they do because the prisons are full? They have a soft attitude on crime. They, people are supposed to go to jail. They go there for 15 minutes, and they go out the revolving door back on the streets. They're out on bail. Rapists out on bail. I know a rapist in Farmington, New Mexico, that's out on bail. He's awaiting trial. <sighs> awaiting trial? Out on bail? He's a rapist. It's, a, it's, a, it's madness. It's insanity. It's, it's a self-destructive uh, country that we live in. And so that's what I'm illustrating. You can't just throw out the Old Testament wherever you want to. No. You better go by the New Testament's explanation of the Old Testament. Look at, uh, where did I have you turn? I'm sorry. Romans 14? Romans 14, uh, verse number 5. Watch this. We're still on the Sabbath day. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he did not regard it. Now, now, let me ask you something. Is it wrong to take Sunday and set it aside and say, I'm not going to work or do anything on Sunday, I'm just going to give that day to God? It's not wrong. God says, if you want to do that, that would be great. Because then you can honor God on that day. But he says, if you're the type of person where you just want to have every day be equal and give every day to God and, and work and please God, he said, that's fine too. Uh, even as a pastor, there are times when I do work on Sunday. I mean, there are times when I have There are times when I finish preaching the Sunday night service, I jump in the car and go do a fire alarm service call. You say, oh, I can't believe you do that. I fall into the category of the man who esteems every day of life. I work seven days a week. And I don't, I don't hold up Sunday as a special day. Is Sunday the Sabbath? No. The Sabbath means seventh. It means the seventh day. And so there's no new Sabbath from the New Testament, it's just that the Sabbath was a figure for the time then present, and it's done. Uh, let me prove it to you further. Look at Hebrews chapter 4. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, I, I understand that you're showing me that the Bible says that uh, I don't have to worry about Sabbath days in, in Colossians 2.16, and I see that you showed me in Romans 14 that I have the option as a Christian of saying, I'm going to esteem every day of life. You say, well, did the disciples observe the Sabbath? Well, look at the book of Acts. You know what they were doing on the Sabbath day all throughout the book of Acts? Soul winning. They were out soul winning. That's what they did. Uh, if you notice, they were going to the synagogues and preaching to the Jews. They were going out by the riverside preaching and, and wherever. They went out soul winning. Okay? And they went out soul winning all the other days, too. Daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So they were doing the same thing every day, it seemed like to me. And... Uh, on Sunday is when they got together on the first day of the week and broke bread with the disciples. And that's why we have church on Sunday, because that's the first day of the week, and that's when anybody in the New Testament ever had a church service. It always was on the first day of the week. And so we follow suit, because we're not smarter than the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, and, uh, and the Bible. But look at Hebrews chapter 4. You say, well, Pastor Anderson, if the Sabbath is a picture or a figure of Jesus Christ coming, what does it mean? What does the figure represent? Well, here's what it represents. It says it in Hebrews chapter 4, what it represents. Look at verse number 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. Remember, that's what the Sabbath was all about, resting. Of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard. That's what saves you, is faith. We're saved by faith, not of works. And it says, for we which have believed...
do enter in to rest. Do you, do you see that? Any, uh, we, we've entered into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a, seven, in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. He, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today after so long a time, as it is, it is said, Today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest unto the people of God. Now wait a minute. There remaineth therefore a rest unto the people of God. Is it the seventh day? Let's find out. Is the rest for God's people today that remains? What's the opposite of remaining? Going away, right? Being done away. The opposite of remaining or staying means it was a figure for the time then present. You know, it's gone now. But there does remain a rest for the people of God. In what way? It says, for he, Hebrews 4.10, for he that has entered into his rest, God's rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. What's the opposite of entering into rest? Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Okay? So, if you believe on Jesus Christ, you've entered into rest because you've ceased from your own works, as God did from His. You've entered into rest. If you're an unbeliever, it's because you're still trusting in your works to save you. And so, the Sabbath day was a picture of salvation, because salvation is no work on our part. It's just faith, it's rest. We just rest upon his promises, standing on the promises that cannot fall. If we rest on Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection as our way to heaven, hey, that's rest. We've ceased from our own works. I've ceased from uh, trying to earn my way into heaven, and I'm resting on Jesus as the only way to heaven, as my only payment for my sin. That is the rest of our... new. You say, what's our Sabbath in the New Testament? Jesus. What, what, what kind of works do you have to do for salvation? None. That's why in the Old Testament, a man in the book of Numbers was gathering sticks upon the Sabbath day. He was put to death. God said, no work on the Sabbath, because it was picturing no works involved for salvation. You say, well, there's got to be faith and works. Wrong. You missed the whole point of the Sabbath. You missed the whole point of the fourth commandment. You missed the whole point of the Old Testament Sabbath, because you're trying to work on God's Sabbath, which is Jesus Christ. The Old Testament people were saved the same way that we are. You say, well, did they have to do works back then? Good night! There's none righteous, no, not one! You think they were righteous back then? Read the Old Testament and tell me they were righteous. Look at what they did, it was wicked. You say, well, I don't believe that people were born again in the Old Testament. Then why did Jesus say to Nicodemus, art thou a master in Israel and knowest not these things? Why did Jesus expect Nicodemus to know what it meant to be born again? Because anybody who's ever been saved has been born again. Because anybody who's ever been saved has been saved by grace through faith. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the days of Enoch, the Bible says, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. It's always been the same plan of salvation. Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And on down the line. Faith has always been the method of salvation. You say, why? Well, I'm not convinced. We just read it in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. How'd you get saved? The gospel was preached to you. How'd they get saved? The gospel was preached to them. And then it says, but the word preached did not profit them, specifically referring to the children of Israel. Some of them did not believe, according to Hebrews chapter 3 at the end there. Some of them did not believe. So it says, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said. So we see here that uh, the difference between people who are saved in the Old Testament and not is believe. The difference in the New Testament, believe. Born again Old Testament, born again New Testament. You say, oh, I don't believe the Old Testament saints had eternal security. <laughs> what? If, if they didn't have eternal security, then how did Samson go to heaven? And Hebrews chapter 11 makes it clear that Samson went to heaven. He killed himself. Committed suicide. Went to heaven. 
If they didn't have eternal security, then how did King Saul go to heaven? Who started out a great man, loved God. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. The, the, God changed him into another man. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He preached and prophesied the Word of God. But later in his life, do you remember when he commanded Doeg the Edomite to slay 80 and 5 priests of the Lord? Killed 85 people? That's a pretty wicked man. Then, shortly thereafter, consulted with a witch at Endor? Sorcery? And then, shortly thereafter, killed himself by falling on the sword? You say, well, an Amalekite killed him. No, the Bible says that Saul killed himself. An Amalekite later claimed to have killed him, but God said in the book of Chronicles that he killed himself. And that's very clear. Saul and Samson both committed suicide and went to heaven. Why? Because they had everlasting life through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith in the coming Messiah, through faith in the Lord Jehovah, their God. We believe on Him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. That's what the Bible says our salvation is. That was their salvation. They believed on the same person that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Jehovah, God, the Lord, the Lord God. And it's the same God, one God, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one God and Father of all, and on and on. And so salvation's always been by grace through faith. It's always been eternal. It's always been born again. It's always been a one-time thing. It's always been the same as it is right now. Now, they saw through a glass darkly. They didn't know what we know. They didn't know everything about it like we know. But they knew that they were a sinner. And they knew that God was their only hope. And that God would someday provide a propitiation for their sins. The Lamb of God would someday come and be their Savior. The Son of God. And so on and on, you say, well, what, what's changed, Pastor Anderson? What's the difference between the Old and New Testament? Turn to 1 Corinthians 10, but what, what's changed? Well, one thing, the dietary restrictions have definitely been lifted. We know that all those washings are done away with. But please, still continue to take a shower. It was a good idea. It was a good idea back then, and it's probably still a good idea right now. Uh, the washings. I'm under grace. I never have to take a shower again. But, you know, the washings, okay? The food, the drinks changed. What about the priesthood? Do we need to go down to the priest? No, Roman Catholic. It's been changed. <laughs> it's Jesus Christ, the high priest, and all of us are the priesthood of the believers. You say, well, what about the Passover? Do we still celebrate the Passover? Absolutely, but now it's celebrated right here at the local church. It's called communion. And uh, sometimes people have a problem with the word communion, which I can't understand because it's used in the Bible several times about uh, eating the unleavened bread and, and drinking the cup. It's called communion. And it's called that in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I believe in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, but uh, it's called communion. That's a scriptural term. I heard somebody say, well, why do you call that as a Catholic term? Okay, you know what I mean? Well, if they say Savior, oh, Savior is a Catholic term. Well, no, it's a Bible term that they have, uh, you know, hijacked, okay, and, and turned it into something that it's not. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, and I would not that ye should be ignorant, how that all our fathers were under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day, thir um, I'm sorry, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. What's, what are you trying to say, God? Look at the next verse in 11. Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Why were those Old Testament stories written down? Why are the laws written in the Old Testament? For our admonition, for our teaching, for our training. God said it was wrong for them to commit idolatry. Look at verse 7. It's wrong for you to commit idolatry. He says it was wrong for them to commit fornication. Don't you commit fornication. It was wrong for them to tempt Christ. 
Don't you tempt Christ. It was wrong for them to murmur and complain and whine. It's wrong for you to whine. It's wrong for you to murmur. It's wrong for you to complain. Why is it wrong? Because God said it was wrong in the Old Testament. That's why. And God doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. You can't put a law like not committing fornication, you can't put that in the same category with a washing in regard to leprosy or with a dietary restriction. It's not the same thing. God says, you better obey every single law except the one that I specifically said was a picture that's done. What changed? The food changed. What changed? The drinks changed. What changed? The washing changed. What changed? The Sabbath changed. What changed? The Passover changed. What changed? The sacrifice changed. What changed? The priesthood changed. What didn't change? The plan of salvation did not change. Jesus Christ did not change. God's laws did not change in regard to uh, right, wrong. The gender, the difference between genders, uh, the law in regard to the death penalty. Uh, all these different laws, morality, right and wrong, doesn't change. You know, what the, you know what God said about homosexuality, my friend? The death penalty. That changed. Show me where that changed. Didn't change. And you, know, you want to know who the biggest hypocrite in the world is? The biggest hypocrite in the world is the person who believes in the death penalty for murderers and not for homosexuals. Hypocrite. The same God who has sued the death penalty for murderers is the same God who has sued the death penalty for rapists and for homosexuals, for sodomites, queers. That's what it was instituted for, okay? That's God. He doesn't change. Oh, God doesn't feel that way in the New Testament. God never felt anything about it. He commanded and said, they should be taken out and killed. You know why God wanted the Sodomites in the Old Testament to be killed? You know why every good king of Israel, the Bible says they got rid of the Sodomites in the land? You know, the good kings that came after the bad kings, who had allowed the Sodomites to infest their land? They had uh, uh, infiltrated. King Asa got the Sodomites out of the land. Uh, Jehoshaphat exterminated the Sodomites that were left from the days of his father Asa. Why? Because the Sodomites are infectious. That's why. Because they're not reproducers. That goes without saying. They're recruiters. How are they multiplying? Do you not see that they're multiplying? Are you that blind? Have you noticed that there's more than there were last year and the year before and the year before that? What? How are they multiplying? They're reproducing, right? No. Here's a biology lesson. They're not reproducers. They're recruiters. And you know who they're after? Your children. Remember you dropped off your kids last week? That's who they were after. Remember you drop them off and leave them with somebody all the time and you don't know what's at. You drop them off at some daycare, drop them off at some school somewhere, you don't know where they're at. I'll tell you where they're at. They're being recruited by the sodomites. They're being molested by the sodomites. I could tell you so many stories about people that I know being molested and recruited by the sodomites. They recruit through rape. They recruit through molestation. They recruit through violation. They are uh, infecting our society. They are spreading their disease. You say, is, is homosexuality, is it, it's not a physical disease, it's a sin disease. It's a, a wicked, filthy sin disease, and it's spreading on a rampage. Can't you see that it's spreading on a rampage? I mean, can you not see that? Can you not see that it's just exploding in growth? Why? Because each sodomite recruits far more than one other sodomite. Because his whole life is about recruiting other sodomites. His whole life is about violating and hurting people and molesting them. So how many sodomites is one sodomite going to produce? A lot. And that's why it just explodes. The only way to stop, you say, how, how are we going to stop it? Well, you know, you know, why, uh, you know why animals uh, reproduce too much? Have you ever seen an area that's just too many of a certain animal? Like I told my story about being in Glencoe, Illinois. I told this like a long time ago, but about how the ladybugs had infested this, uh, this water treatment facility. And everywhere I walked, there was ladybugs everywhere. And uh, I asked the guy to work, and I said, why are these ladybugs infesting? And he said, oh, man, don't even get me started on that. It's so ridiculous. The boss man thought that it was a good idea because they had this other really small problem with these little bugs to bring in some ladybugs to solve the problem. And the, he just what he said. The ladybugs have no natural predators in Glencoe, Illinois. 
and nothing is killing them. Nothing's eating them. They have no natural predators, and so they're just <laughs> they're just multiplying, and we, you know we don't know how to stop them. You know why the sodomites are reproducing so much? Or not reproducing, good night. Recruiting? Because they have no natural predators. You know who should be their predator? The police. Remember those people that are supposed to protect us that never do? <laughs> and yes, I'm saying that because I live in Tempe. And because I live in Phoenix. Maybe there's some place in America, you know, where the police do their job. But we don't live there. Okay? I'm, I don't mind saying that. Hello? You know what... Do you not live in the same town I live in? If you're looking at me funny right now, you must not live in Phoenix, okay? I got rear-ended on the freeway, a hit and run. I couldn't even get the policeman to go after the guy. I said, there he is, he's right there. Oh, he said, the rental car company probably won't charge you. I said, are you insane? I said, the whole back of my car is smashed in. It's a rental car. Oh, they might not charge you. The damage isn't that major. I had to fight the guy to get him to fill out a report. I said, well, I wrote down the license plate. Can you check on the license plate? He said, we don't really do that for hidden runs. He said, maybe if it was a homicide. That's what he said. He said, well, if it was a homicide, you know, we'd probably look into it. And, I, and this is what I told the guy to his face. I got angry at the guy. I mean, I wasn't really mad at him, but I was just expressing my anger to him. And I told him, I said this, I said, I said, well, you know what? I said, I guess these guys might as well, if they, if they rear end somebody, they might as well just take their chances. Why would they pull over? Why would they pull over and give me their information? Why would they uh, face up to their consequences? Like the Bible says in the Mosaic Law in Exodus, how if you break somebody's stuff, you got to replace it. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that another one that you're trying to throw out while you're cutting up the Bible and, and chopping it up in pieces and deciding what you want to obey? The law that says that if you break somebody's stuff and cause them to miss work, you got to reimburse them for that? That came from the book of Exodus. I told the guy, I said, if you're not even going to go after them, if they know you're not going to do anything about it, they might as well just take their chances. I, and I told him, I said, I'll bet even if you caught the guy, there'd be like no consequences for him. And he said, yeah. I said, what would you even do to the guy if you caught him? Well, there's not really much we can do. Then he might as well take his chance. Why would, it, why would he even stop, right? Why stop and give me his information if he can just drive off and go on his merry way and have no consequences? Because the police aren't doing their job because our justice system is just insane. Oh, I can't believe you'd say that. You know, while other churches are parading unsaved police officers across their church platform, honor the police Sunday, where they have a bunch of unsaved police officers in the house of God parade across the, the, the platform, I'm going to stand here and tell you the police aren't doing their job. And I'm not saying that there's, a, there's not a good police officer. You know what I'm saying. There are good police officers out there, and I feel bad for them. Because even when they bring somebody in, even when they go out and work hard and do what they need to do, the court system just turns them out on the street. The revolving door at the jailhouse just sends them out on their merry way. Look, I heard about a guy, an illegal immigrant. Oh, I'm sorry, an undocumented migrant. <laughs> I heard about an illegal immigrant. He ran down a 16-year-old boy who was walking home from school, drunk driving. He ran him over and killed him. How do you think that kid's mom and dad feel? And he was let out on bail for zero dollars and zero cents. What do you think he did? I'm sure he sat around and awaited trial. No, he went back down to Mexico. Okay? And there's no consequences for killing somebody because of alcohol. Because of his stinking liquor. His stinking fun. His little night on the town. He went out and killed somebody. The guy's drinking in the middle of the daytime. Drunk. Fool. And he kills innocent life. No consequences. See, the police aren't doing their job. They don't enforce the law. And uh, I don't know what that had to do with the sermon. But I, it's still good. It's still true. And so, again... Let's just close the sermon right there. But anyway, the, 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 we see here the correlation. Do you understand now as you read the Bible? Does that help you? Because as you read the Bible now, you're going to be able to see that when God, you know, you flip open the Bible and you're looking through these laws. Good night. I just, I just read a whole lot of the Old Testament on this drive I was on this week. I had Alexander Scurby in the, in the stereo, as always, listening to the Bible on tape. Man alive, I listened to a lot. And it, was, it was mostly Old Testament. This particular week, I was doing a lot in the Old Testament. I learned so much. 
I mean, I learned so many practical things that I'm going to put into practice in my life. I learned so much great doctrine. I learned so much about Jesus reading the Old Testament. Don't throw out 75% of the Bible. Have you ever noticed how big the, the New Testament is? If you have a Bible without a big dictionary and everything, this is the Old Testament and this is the New Testament. Is this all you want to live by right here? Well, it'll probably be easier. But uh, I'm going to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. When I read one of the things that's changed, I'm going to understand, oh, that's talking about Jesus. Oh, okay, leprosy, that whole washing, that's talking about being, being washed in the blood of Jesus. That's what that's about. That's a figure. That's a picture. When I see about the tabernacle, I say, hey, that's a picture of the house of God, the local church. I say, oh, that's a picture. Oh, okay, I see that. And anything else, anything else where God says, don't do it, I'm going to say, yes, sir, God. I'm not going to try to make theological excuses to explain away God's word and say, well, this doesn't apply to me. This doesn't apply to me about uh, divorce. This doesn't apply to me about... Uh, this doesn't apply to me about, you know, murder. This doesn't apply to me about homosexuality. This doesn't apply to me about not marrying my sister. Look, it's wrong in 2007 to marry your sister. It's wrong to marry your aunt. It's wrong to marry these people because God said it back then. And, and you know what? If you're going to sit there and say that, that, that the Sodomites in the New Testament, they're fine. You know, like the Episcopalians think and the United Methodists think. I guess marrying your sister's fine. I guess marrying your, your own mom and dad and mother-in-law and, and animals, because that's all in the same chapter. You can marry an animal next. And it's coming. If you don't think it's coming, you haven't read the Bible, because that's where it went in Canaan land. When, you, you know that really weird chapter in Leviticus where it lists all those weird, sick things that, that normal people wouldn't even think of? In Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, and you read about the animal stuff and the weird stuff, and you're like, and the... the Interfamily stuff, you're reading it, you're just like, why is this even in the Bible? What, what are we reading? But then you get to the end of the chapter, it says, For all these abominations did the inhabitants of the land which were before you. And I'm going to tell you something, the world's only getting worse. People will do those things once again in the United States. And it's going to be a scary, scary place. What should we do, Pastor Anderson? What are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. Faithful Word Baptist Church is going to lift up the Bible high and say, Every word of God is pure. Every word is what I'm going to live by. I can differentiate, I can rightly divide the word of truth, not into dispensations that don't exist, but rather I can divide it into the figures of Christ to come in the Old Testament and into the laws of God that are eternal. They're clearly differentiated in the Bible. This sermon right here just gave you the tools to easily see the difference. It's not that complicated. It's not that hard to see the difference. And when you read the Bible this year, and you're going through the Old Testament... This will help you if, you if you think about these things and understand these things. And uh, don't, ever, don't ever tell me that what I'm preaching is out of the Old Testament so it doesn't apply. Good night. I'm going to do a lot of preaching out of the Old Testament because it's a big piece of the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. and. Uh...